Did we want to wait another minute or so for any uh, other stragglers to join us? So uh, welcome everyone to the master class of Dr. Peter Fielding um, on the uh, post uh, tonal applications for ethnomusicological and music education inquiry. Uh, this master class aligns with the goal of the graduate programs to advance music scholarship uh, that reflects the ongoing changes at the local, regional, national, and world political levels. No? Um, also, uh, employ current and alternative methods of music research and creative work that best suit the Philippines, the Southeast Asian, and global regions, as well as produce relevant research or creative output that optimizes the resources that we have, just like what we have now. Uh, we have Peter Fielding for the master class. And of course, advocate for the study of expressive communication for the advancement of human society. Uh, at first, let's uh, listen to the, uh, our, uh, the new president of the graduate programs. We have J.J. Liao to introduce our speaker. J.J. Good afternoon, everyone. And our guest for today serves as Associate Dean for the College of the Arts and Associate Professor of Music of the Bailey School of Music at Kennesaw State University in the Atlanta metropolitan area. As a music theorist, his analyses of music foster music literacy skill acquisition while growing awareness of contemporary instrumental and underutilized historic and global traditional vocal repertoire. He has previously taught and led programs at Mahidol University College of Music, various colleges and universities in the United States and Canada, and the music branch of the Canadian Armed Forces. Please welcome Dr. Peter G. Fielding. Thank you ever so much. Uh, I'm just going to do the ubiquitous share screen <laughs> so that we're all there. And just as a final check, is it, are we able to see this? We're good to go? Wonderful. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Just to, for point of context where we are, uh, I get so over here. <laughs> I'm originally from Atlantic Canada in Nova Scotia with that. And I'm uh, currently in the Atlanta area here. And I know there's an ocean separating us, but a decade ago, this was home for me. So although uh, we're several time zones away, it, it, it's still home. And I'm glad to be able to connect with you as I worked with some of your former professors when I was, was in uh, Thailand a decade ago. Uh, more specifically, most of my time in the Philippines has been spent in uh, Cebu and the island of Bohol, just giving you the context of my time uh, ta time and experience uh, with the Philippines as a nation and community. I'll now minimize this and get on with it. <laughs> Thank you. Much of the traditional vocal repertoire employing Western scalar tunings have only been assessed with tonal and modal basic scalar descriptors while uh, labels such as the major scale, the mixolydian mode, or the do, re, mi, so, la, pentatonic scale are convenient labels, they do not map the rich variety of pitch collections and chromatic elements spanning many songs. Post-tonal analytic tools can offer some approaches to survey vast collections of music of variable pitch content and collection size. 
Richard Christman's notion of a successive interval array has merits for mapping such a repertoire as it enables the appraisal of a melody in terms of its intervallic content without having to commit to the implied analytical associations of traditional scalar and modal descriptors. The use of tonic-centered successive linear arrays to map a large collection of music can be a powerful tool to distill emergent scalar collections. This talk will trace prior approaches in North America and the United Kingdom, introduce the tonic centered successful interval array and demonstrate its application surveying approximately 2,000 songs uh, spanning English, French, and Gaelic languages to identify cumulative and language-specific trends within this collection. A range of labels have been used to appraise pitch collections spanned by the traditional vocal music of the British Isles, as well as Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand, places sharing a pan-colonial influence. In 1865, Ernest Gagnon penned the first analytical writings concerning the traditional vocal music of Canada to describe the French songs of Quebec. He identified that folk songs share pitch collections with older, lit older liturgical music, referred to as la tonalité ancien, ancient tonalities, rather than the modern tonalities of major and minor scales. These modal labels would continue to be used by internationally recognized traditional music scholars such as Cecil Sharp, as well as Canadian-based scholars like P Kenneth Peacock. Cecil Sharp's English folk song, Some Conclusions of 1907, describes m scales, modes, and pentatonic collections observed during his study of folk song repertoire. The executor of Sharp's estate, Maud Carpellis, published extensively in the area of Western European and North American folk song scholarship and shared some of the songs that she collected in Newfoundland, Canada with Ralph Vaughan Williams, who went on to compose and publish piano accompaniments of them as uh, 15 folk songs from Newfoundland. Similarly, Kenneth Peacock added chord symbols to the melodies that he transcribed for Helen Creighton's uh, Maritime Folk Songs. And in the preface about the music, he comments that the frequency of some scales, modes, and pentatonic patterns of the repertoire caution that some modal melodies may not be readily harmonized by traditional uh, tonal chord progressions. Uh, folk song scholarship by music theorists include Robert Galden and J. Ram. In Galden's The Cycle 7 Complex, Relations of Diatonic Set Theory to the Evolution of Ancient Tonal Systems, uh, he surveys historical scalar assessments of British folk song, summarizing the observations made by Cecil Sharp, Anne Gilchrist, and Bertrand Harris Bronson. Rand's an introduction to the English language folk song style too, tonality, modality, harmony, an intonation in La Reine's Clark's traditional song surveys the historical labeling practices of folk song repertoire with church modes, identifying the strengths of Bronson's relative and Norman Cadson's parallel approaches. Ron identifies the value of Bronson's work for assessing specific repertoire, but assesses that the repertoire did not wholly align with the other people's approaches. Uh, Galden summarizes Bronson's mode star as a graphical depiction of the interrelationship shared by fort set classes 535, 632, and 735. Here the outer points of the star correspond to complete scales and uh, modes circled in blue. Ionian, Mixolydian, Dorian, Aeolian, Phrygian, Lydian, uh, Locrian, and Lydian with the Y. Each intersection of two star arms identifies a hybrid collection, hexatonic, lacking one of the scale degrees. For example, in the Ionian Mixolydian, hexatonic lacks scale degree 7, and that, that's, that overlap with that. And similarly, uh, as that's the note that it diff differs between the two modes. And as you delve into the, this inner circle, uh, in purple, it corresponds to the pentatonic collections lacking two scale pi two pitches from the, the comparator seven note scale in the outer ring. As we convert this acute heptagram into pitch collections uh, to make it real, uh, there are some relative and parallel approaches uh, to, to plot the interval patterns uh, with that. And while the, the acute heptagram is beautiful, it only works for the uh, scales and collections that are perfectly matching with that, and, and music is much more varied and flexible. Uh, 
And that's where the systems break down and we have to figure out how we're going to describe this stuff. <laughs> Regardless of the scalar terminologies advocated by prior scholars and analysts of Western pitch diatonic musics, flexible and versatile means of assessment is needed to accurately describe the variety and nuances of pitch spaces spanned by the, the various repertoires. And although post-tonal analysis has been used to describe tonal features found in contemporary music of the Western fine art tradition, and particularly the Second Viennese School and subsequent generation of composers that they influenced, they've not been applied to the analysis of traditional vocal music in any large extent. As a case study to explore the merits of adapting Richard Christman's successive interval array to study survey a large number of songs, I gathered a collection of Atlantic Canadian melodies from Nova Scotia published without analysis of any kind for some initial surveying. Tonic centered successive interval arrays can be used to label and categorize the intervals spanned, the, spanned by individual pitches. Regardless of scalar construct, when measured against a referential tonic, a successive interval array can be mapped onto its constituent pitch classes. Mapping the successive interval arrays of a large collection of music can be a powerful tool to distill emergent scalar collections and thereafter be described with uh, whatever scalar or modal descriptors best fit the collections. Successful interval array can be generated for any group of pitches by identifying all the pitches in a melody, arranging them in an ascending order within an octave above a reckoning pitch, labeling each note uh, with its appropriate pitch class, and uh, labeling all the interval classes, including the pitches spanning last to first uh, along with that. As, a, as an example, here's a little encoding of what I uh, did for the song Sir Hugh. Uh, figure one presents the music notation for Sir Hugh as found in a version published by Helen Creighton in Songs and Ballads from Nova Scotia. Uh, with page, figure two, it just shows the condensed pitch map that we're doing that. We just, uh, for this melody, I was inferring a tonic a C, so we've got C, uh, C, E, C, E flat, F, G, and then B flat. So this is just makes a little tone set pitch map with that material. Uh, technically, they map onto those pitch classes where C is mapped onto zero. If we uh, plot these onto a clock diagram, uh, what I was referring to, you could then measure the, the absolute intervals uh, spanning each of the pitches uh, of that collection with that. And uh, if you had picked a different tonic, then it would just be a different point that you'd then start doing your measuring. And uh, with, with this, uh, if we were to use sc conventional scalar descriptors, though this melody technically is aligns with the C minor, lacking the supertonic and submediant, it also aligns with the C Dorian, lacking the same uh, item pitches. You could also call it an incomplete C Phrygian, and, and as, as the potential for this multiplicity of valid scalar and modal labels is fraught with theoretically plausible gapped scales that uh, interpolate non-existent pitches and over-interpret the collection, it's easier just to be mindful of Occam's razor. Don't multiply beyond necessity. Just It's just a five pitch collection. We can just describe the basic uh, skeleton through these broader interval patterns and say this is what we got. Uh, if we were to take some, I'll say, common trends, some scalar patterns like that, I plotted out some sample pitch collections, what it would be using base 12 uh, for a duodecimal thing, and what's important for the success of interval arrays, it, it's measuring the interval between these pitches. So like what would be 0, 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, E, O, oh, just the major scale with that. The re reality benefit is this is identifying the patterns uh, th that exist. You could take any pitch, apply this interval schema to it for semitones, and it would be able to create it. And uh, I, I like it as you then get to accommodate for chromaticism. Whereas uh, using just a basic modal or scalar descriptor, it, it doesn't have the vocabulary aside from a whole lot of, hi, this is a raised supertonic, or this is, it, it becomes a lot more cumbersome and wordy, whereas this is, it's just there. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned with uh, that first song, Sir Hugh, its interval uh, pattern would map onto this, but if you picked a different one, you could wind up cycling through them. So for, for this is a way of grouping related melodies uh, that have a shared materials that, that say there's, there's different rotations, cyclic permutations. 
Chrisman uh, does refer to it, but I, I just plotted it all onto a matrix to then uh, show, and then anything that's going this way also maps down that way. That way, if you're taking a lot of unknown repertoire and you're noticing similarities, you could then uh, plot them up together and say, hey, there's some overlap. Uh, as an example with this, if we took our more familiar uh, scalers, uh, scales and related modes, well, as you know, like the Dorian mode, in a relative approach, it starts on the supertonic, and it, uh, which would be there, rotating over, and you just cycle through it. Phrygian starts with the semitone, Lydian gets our nice little tritone, which is two success three successive uh, major seconds with that. And this uh, just shows an example of how you could plot all the melodies fitting that onto a single grid with that. This mapping process, or the ideas that I'm putting forth with this, do align with, I'll say, some other music theorists that are talking about uh, how do we measure other musics and th with that. Uh, aligning with uh, Jay Rand's materials, uh, basically uh, using base 12 numbering, uh, you're able to make something that fits within the octave. Uh, it, it's a technically a form of quantitative analysis that it's very helpful for some quantification and, and number crunching. Uh, it, it helps with some materials with that and this is just you, it's I found it helpful for trying to be able to visualize and then plot and then map uh, these unknown pitch spaces. As a, a case study I wanted to take a look at songs that I came from <laughs> with that. And so this is just along the Bay of Funday, uh, World's Highest Tides with that. Uh, what I did for, I, I took every source of music that I could find that uh, could attribute a music transcription to a specific person in a specific place and at a, a time. So that technically you could do some geomapping and, and do some regional trends, but I just wanted to see how much I could find. And so the repertoires that I dug up wound up aligning with English, French, and Gaelic song bases. And uh, this spanned about a century of publications, where, uh, and I'm relying on the transcriptions made by other people uh, for these publications. I, I teach oral skills, I teach people song transcription, but I just wanted to do a survey of what already existed in print, because no one had ever really done a meta-analysis throwing these things together. Uh, as an example, what I did for every song uh, this is uh, like one of sample. Ave Maria Stella, Dei Mater Alma. You just take that, you say, I infer A is my tonic, put all the notes together to form your pitch map, say, okay, A is tonic. That's this one pretty easy example. It's the major scale. And then plotting all that. If you took a whole lot of songs, from like that song was from a collection of 563 French language songs, of them, there were 328 uh, seven-note scales, and so I just plotted every single one of what it would work out to, and uh, uh, yeah, there, there's a whole lot of do, re, mi, fa, yeah, yeah, so this we're liking this, but there's a lot of some chromatic elements, tritones, like sometimes they're diminished fifth, sometimes it's augmented fourth. <laughs> this is invites the opportunity to dig in and say, hey, what's so special about this scalar collection that has that? Why is that happening? Those are questions for later, but this is just showing you how you can plot everything. Uh, similarly, when you've got a melody that has some chromaticism in it, uh, Prince Eugene, when we look at it, technically there's nine distinct pitches that reoccur, sometimes recurring lower chromatic neighbors, that repeats a couple of times, another little chromatic neighbor. As that happens regularly, if you say that we're all part of the collection, technically I'm perceiving D, pitch class two, as the tonic, and then you've got this very, a couple different, you've got a variable third, and then you have the example of a leading tone as well as a subtonic. So basic scalar labels don't accommodate that, but this is a way of plotting it. If you took Again, for that collection of French songs, there are about 15 of them. A whole lot of different chromaticisms. Again, some fun tritones, uh, and we've got our uh, lowered, soup, uh, our lowered uh, scale degree two. That's a fun little one there. Uh, but what you wind up doing is, for all the, each of the songs you wind up doing, I wound up plotting into a more traditional pitch map with some materials there, 
And that, that's one of the things that I've found helpful going back to my oral skills teaching uh, with that is then it's a repository of material. You, you find a melody that's got some fun characteristics, you dig down deeper, and then you see how that aligns with your curriculum for what you're teaching. But if you take a look at all the songs that I was looking at for this, uh, 1,900 and so, um, I, I plotted all the trends, uh, grouped them by how many distinct pitches were happening, and uh, go figure, there's a whole lot of seven note scales. That's what we expect to see. <laughs> a whole lot of hexatonics. Yep, not every melody is going to span all. But uh, it just a nice little sort of a bell curve <laughs> of distribution of that. The, these are the fun chromatic ones. Uh, what I did was like, as let's say for an example, this pentatonic, we're 243 of them. Well, I plotted them all down. This is just all done with Excel, no fancy software. And if you look at all of them together, you, you could one, count up the frequency of individual collections, or you could pl plot the totality of them down to say, hey, of all the pentatonic melodies, these are the emergent pitches. So tonic and dominant, they're to be expected. Supertonic, yeah, some flexibility in the mediant, and a little bit of submediant there. But pretty close, pretty similar, uh, a number of occurrences. If we were to break down that collection of pentatonics by language type. Them, uh, French and English, uh, are uh, everything, like the, the combined English and Gaelic were all the same, do, re, mi, so, la, with what we expect. But I found with the French language songs, it really was just the first five notes of the major scale with that. As, you, as I dug deeper, mapping into different totalities of hexatonic collections, uh, I'd say, hey, this corresponds to like a variable third over here near equal frequency of subtonic and leading tone. Hey, that, that, that's some interesting information to learn about. Again, those fun outliers may be interesting for a deeper analysis at another time. But when we take this hexatonic again, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, yeah, we are not, not getting, that's, that's reasonable, we expect that. With the French language, uh, I've, because of the near, uh, similarity of like with the French repertoire, the mediant, uh, lowered mediant or just a mediant, with that, th that didn't, wasn't the most determinant uh, factor. And so just the rest of the scale w was more prevalent. And what was fun was with the Gaelic, uh, the lowered mediant was very common as well as the subtonic. Uh, this is stuff you couldn't see if you were just looking up at all of it together. This is where some linguistic uh, uh, knowledge and just saying, hey, we're teasing this out. and while I did this as a basic comparison of language type, you could also do it by, by uh, song type. You could do other different types of sorting. Don't want to bury you, but, but technically, if we looked at all those mm, seven note scales, again, uh, a whole lot of uh, mediant, different types of mediants, uh, the, the lower third that made, uh, sorry. Uh, you're just mapping them out and say, yep, th this is the trending ones. The major scale does dominate. That's how tonality functions. We expect that. Uh, English and French readily aligned. And then with the Gaelic repertoire, again, the subtonic for here, as well as the lowered mediant. That, that was, I'll say, the most interesting thing of that. Uh, when you start getting chromatic elements added, You've got this vocabulary, you say, well, you don't want to call it octatonic necessarily because there's so much, uh, I'll say, implied symmetrical octatonic repertoire talking about some Russian-based repertoires of alternating uh, whole tone and semitone. So I, I just call it asymmetrical octatonic so that no one invites the question. But uh, when you got uh, 173 of them, it's like, yep, yeah, the, the variable mediant happens. Well, uh, the, the, this is the, the mediant uh, happens more commonly there, but the subtonic and leading tone are near equal uh, uh, appearances. We've, we're getting that. And then when you delve into the Gaelic language, I found the variable mediant was the more prevalent one. Now you can keep on digging to this. Technically, everything that I looked at is there on it. But uh, what I want to identify linked to this is uh, I, I, while well, I showed an example of just three language sources with 
a hundred years of repertoire, I know there's a lot more repertoire out there. And I'm, I'm currently trying to track down publications of transcriptions. Uh, I'm currently looking at a six volume collection of folk songs from the Visayan reason, as I, I've got family in Bohol. I'm just trying to track down as many publications. I've got various song books that have the lyrics and chord symbols, but no music notation. And so I'm uh, trying to track down things like that. And as a slight departure, uh, a couple of years ago, I did get married in Bohol, and one of the churches I got married in uh, was damaged. And so some of the music materials that are in the archives uh, are, have been sent up to Manila. And so I can't actually access those materials, but uh, they are of some value. And I know there's some people in Manila that have invested careers uh, promoting some material. So a big thing I wanted to do uh, with today was share with you some techniques and approaches that I use as I'm, I've been looking at some material and I'm currently lost as try to get this I'm currently don't see people Okay, so question and answer now. Uh, oh, stop share. There. Okay, everyone's uh -huh. going. Sorry, I was just lost in my screens and you could see that. But uh, uh, I'll say uh, I've given uh, a presentation on a, a formal analytical approach that can be used for modeling materials. I've identified how I might use it for some music ed. I see a lot of value in it mapping greater collections of song repertoire, which is a value for ethnomusicological work as well as some other materials, but I'll, I'll yield the table for any conversation. <laughs> okay, JJ, you want to take over for the Q&A with uh, Trish yes, or well, uh, whoever is there? Okay. Yes, yeah, so we have some questions. Well, um, Nicolo, Nicolo Vito is raising his hand, so we'd like to call on Nicolo, Nico Vito, to ask yes. his question. Uh, thank you, JJ and Dr. Muigo. Thank you, Dr. Fielding. Um, I was overwhelmed by the star, so it's not like the it's like the Christmas star. It's very overwhelming. Uh, but I, I I do want to uh, on a serious note. I, I was uh, pretty much um, interested in your tabulations uh, because it um, one of the things I've been interested in is finding the variations, but not but not scalar variations, sir. But yep. um, the variations of uh, how folk songs, which are already annotated, um, which are already notated rather, um, how they continue to uh, live and exist mm -hmm. in communities uh, in ways that are not aligned to what is already notated. So I, I was wondering if you, uh, this kind of methodology of yours can be applied not to just scalar uh, not just the scales, but also to melodies. Well, uh, it can, and thank you for sharing your research interest with that. Uh, with what I looked at for like these other songs, I did it specifically where there could be a name linked with a specific transcription, because what you're talking about is uh, uh, taking a look at many different versions of a song and trying to see where there might be some overlap, either uh, similarities or differences. And some of those differences may be w linked with the interpretation of some of the lyrics. It might be linked with just the melody nuances. And so uh, that, that is an exciting area because, of course, it, it, it's, uh, there's a mosaic. There's going to be many different versions. And you, you could focus on pick what f songs you're trying to look at and then say, hey, there's 10 or 20 or 30 different versions that have that, that have been recorded or, or have been uh, performed or things that you're able to get access. Uh, some of it might involve your, your transcribing regional recordings that you're finding and then plotting it down. Uh, so uh, that definitely, uh, there, there's ways of doing it. With what I did, I, I didn't dig up, but there, there's a whole number of songs that have the same name, similar lyrics, that I could compare side by side and say, hey, uh, this, this is someone else's interpretation. But uh, thank you well, for... Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm just glad that uh, I, I was able to, you know, serendipitously find an approach to what I was planning to do. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sure. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Nico, for your question. Are there any more questions? We encourage, oh, uh, we are calling um, Trixie Abrera.
Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk, Dr. Fielding. My question is about how you undertook the, the counting. Was it manual or was there a kind of uh, automation or software? Because you were counting how many? Hundreds? I, I did about one, almost 2,000 songs. I honestly just used Excel. Uh, everything was a manual count. What I did was for every public, every collection, I made its own little Excel sheet uh, uh, of all the songs. I listed all the, like what I showed in the slide, every single song had its own little mapping. I had my little interval array and then I plotted that out on different columns, added that up, and then I added each volume together. And it was, it was a lot of manual uh, time. It, it's not difficult, it just takes time. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, there might be more eloquent uh, solutions if I had the coding skill, but uh, uh, Excel auto sum tables is, is honestly, uh, uh, then you can use Excel to plot graphs and tables. Uh, it, it, you don't need high tech. <laughs> right. For me, it, it was more intensive doing the transcribing in another part of the research where you're just uh, in doing the encoding yourself. So yeah, no, no, no proprietary software. It, it's just honest counting. <laughs> So that's pretty impressive. 2,000 works. <laughs> well, it's, uh, uh, I'll say, as with some of your own ethnological research, I was trying to advocate the song repertoire where I came from. And uh, for I just wanted to say, hey, the stuff where I'm from is important, and it may not be talked about by other places, so I'm just trying to say this could be a model, call it a case study, uh, uh, but now there's there's other song repertoires to take a look at. Thank you. Thank you, Trixie, for your question. We have a question from the chat. Pat, are you interested in um, saying your question out? Or uh, this, oh. there's this question on pop music applications, Dr. Fielding. How oh, would this yeah. method be applicable to pop music, especially Sam Smith's Unholy? I'm not sure if we are. <laughs> we are they oh, are the uh, that was set in a musical mode, so... Well, the, the simple thing is uh, any piece of music could be modeled. Like, the, this successive interval array, when originally put forth, was being used to describe uh, uh, contemporary uh, Western fine art music that actually was post-tonal and did not even have a tonic. I, I adapted the architecture that Chrisman was using to describe some patterns and said, hey, let's, if something has a tonic, let's just use this as the measuring tool with that. So that was my appropriation and adaptation of a technique. Uh, you could use it for any piece of music that could be Western tuned. Now, if you wanted to do music that had different tunings, then you'd create a slightly different measuring process. But, but it, anything in pop music, that's going to be conventional uh, the, uh, keyboard tuning material. So it, you could do it. And uh, the, yeah, the, the, it's, there, there's no, I'll say, aesthetic. It's just, all, it's just pitch material. <laughs> and yeah, adding to this, although I talked about what I'm doing for scalar collections, this uh, array could actually be used to model contour of melody if, if you needed something beyond modern what exists already in our Western notation system. Oh, there could be many applications. I, I'm starting to imagine how it can be used for... Um... But I, I don't want to replace the five-line staff system that we already have. <laughs> I'm just saying if it helps and adds to the conversation, it's, it's another tool. <laughs> yes, it's, it really looks like a useful tool. We need to brush up on our... Um... Excel skills, I guess, and how to how to math. We'd like to call in Dr. Arwin Dan for his question. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fielding, for that. Um, uh, I would say um, eye-opening uh, new methodology of uh, inter uh, of analyzing melodies <laughs> that you use calculations that you have done. Um, I was just curious when I saw the septatonic. Uh, septatonic scale uh, analysis that you have mm -hmm. shown out of all of the uh, scales like the hexatonic pentatonic etc 
etc. in the octatonic. It's only in the septatonic uh, music or songs that we see that the uh, uh, dominant, the, the occurrence of uh, dominant is less than that of, I think, uh, sixth. So it's, it's only in the uh, septatonic scale uh, songs that we see the uh, recurrence of the sixth more than the dominant. So uh, I was just curious about uh, is, is there an explanation to this or have you uh, gone into oh, uh, Let me uh, clarify back to that because I was dancing through those a little quickly. Let's, uh, I'm going to try to share screen here. If I'm not mistaken, it's on figure 16. Yep. Yeah, figure 16. Uh, so 884, uh, this was for what I, the source collection, this pitch class 7 would correspond to the dominant. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, so, so like a, 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 since I, everything uh, was assigned to tonic, of course, the, the total number would, would be that number, 884. So in all but one, uh, the dominant wa was clearly visible uh, with there. So w I don't even remember which one, but that's, I guess, a reasonable thing for me to go look at, is which one didn't have the dominant. Uh, so I, I hope that clarifies that, you no, know, the, the dominant uh, was the most, uh, most prevalent followed by then the subdominant and then the supertonic. All right, all right. So thank yeah. you. Then, uh, yeah. Glad to help clarify uh, yeah, as I, do, I don't want to map things out. What, what's neat is uh, when you, the fun thing is when you gather a lot of songs, then you get some statistically significant numbers to then share some opinions and say, hey, this is what I see. <laughs> right, right. Now let's uh, get this out again. I don't know why I'm losing I didn't mean to dominate that. Stop share there. Yeah, stop share. Yeah. Thank you Computer had an update. Okay. <laughs> I thought that it was a, uh, it was something uh, peculiar. For, for no, no, topic. glad to to help clarify. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Doctor Fielding, I was very fascinated with the data on how the dominant was more common in in um english songs rather in french songs and in, in french songs the yeah it just uh, I, know, I mean it was it before and then the four was more common in french can't remember if i saw it correctly <laughs> yeah no uh, with that and just uh, uh i i was doing the count for what i did now it rather than just say it absolutely has to be this one what I showed a few times is like, hey, a lot of these songs have like sort of this variable third or variable subtonic. So it's not saying there isn't a median. It's just saying if you had to pick one specific pitch, it occurs less frequently. So it's less uh, a model for that language type. I have a question for Dr. Fielding. Um, how have your students utilized the same tool in their research? Well, I will uh, say I've taught post-tonal analysis, and uh, since I left Macedon University, I no longer have a graduate program uh, in music to be uh, supporting and mentoring. So uh, uh, I've not had a lot of students to work with with this level of analysis, because like when I'm teaching undergraduate theory or introductory graduate level post-tonal stuff, you get into the basics. Uh, I and. Uh, my last position in Canada, I was overseeing a program and I not, was not allowed to teach <laughs> because I had an admin appointment. So here uh, at my institution, uh, next semester, I'm going to teach 20th century music theory. And uh, while I'm using my uh, uh, faculty colleague's uh, draft textbook that he's working on, I'm going to weave in a few units in my stuff. <laughs> So you know, the question you're asking, I'm hoping to realize next semester. And my angle is I don't want to supplant uh, the basics that they need to learn. But if there's space and opportunity, I'll draw attention and show, hey, yeah, this is how you might play with it a little bit. Uh. Very uh, interesting prospects. We will hear about it, I'm sure. Uh, there's another question, Dr. Fielding, from Joshua Ansale. Could the same model be used to identify trends in the use of non-chord tones and or extensions in harmonic progressions as in an underlying counterpoint within the harmony akin to those in the art music of Santiago or Abelardo? So uh, 
focus on composers, I guess. Yeah, great question. And since you're saying your question is to specific composers, that would then allow you to then focus in what you're mapping and looking for some emergent trends. With what I showed in the slides, I'll, I'll make this available as a PDF in case anyone wants to look at it later, but uh, with those excels where I plotted every single melody and then showed how the frequency, it, you're just simply looking at what would be a chromatic uh, element in, in what you think is the 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 the, the model's scalar pat or modal pattern that's going on. Say, so where's the chromatic system happening? Uh, and so, for a specific composer, you're, you're just trying to identify what's what's the pitch vocabulary that this composer is using. Uh, wh what are the recurring patterns? Where are there deviations from that norm? So, so part of that is just just learning. Uh, what this, what that composer is doing, a and uh, they don't have to be confined by the the descriptors I've put forth because uh, new music is freely composed. <laughs> so it's them. What's the aesthetic that that composer is doing? I can't question where they, who trained them, and what they, what voice they're trying to share. So there's just different ways you could describe some of their expression. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Fielding, and thank you to Joshua for the question. Um, do we have more questions from the participants? I also have another question. Sure. <laughs> I, I'm very curious. Have you ever tried to use this um, tool or method to compare the pitch tones with harmonic occurrences? Well, uh as you get to the melody line, yes, because then you're saying, "Hey, why is there this chromatic? Why is there a, 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 this tritone? What, what is what's the context?" Uh, as with the non-atonic melody that I showed of two lower chromatic neighbor tones, there wasn't an implied harmonic vocabulary. But as I'm looking at the material, I actually want to see where there's some more advanced harmonic treatment because then I can steal the music and put it in my theory curriculum. Because <laughs> if I can find an example of more than just the chromatic nuance but a couple other chord tones that are related to it, then I can say, look, it's an example of an applied harmony. <laughs> And that's really what all this uh, uh, repertoire is. You're just trying to say, how can I advocate its merits to overlap the, the curriculum that I have to teach or the curriculum that I'm forging? Uh, 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 rather than rely solely on dead European composers, there's a lot of music that has these characteristics that are curricular topics. <laughs> so I'm trying to dig deeper. <laughs> That would be very interesting to see how they interrelate on a yeah because we're now, all used to examining um, music in terms of function. And yeah, uh, and uh, that's what we want to hope. And uh, I'll say, I did a lot of work in oral skills pedagogy, uh, and like the, the, in the folk song anthologies, like there, there's a lot more variety, but a lot of it's more lyrical melody stuff. So it. Uh, where possible, I, I want to try to delve into some of the harmonic architecture where we might be able to integrate it more into some of the classroom theory materials as, as better, uh, broader things. I do see in the chat, it says, can you tell us more about the work you did in the Visayas? And uh, yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Magdamo, I, I've been trying to get a copy of her dissertation, <laughs> but uh, I... Uh, Magdamo's collection, I, I was able to do an interlibrary loan to borrow some of the materials, and I, I'm just at a very initial stage of it. Uh, some of the melodies that were transcribed in that collection is about 600. There's a copy of it uh, at one university that, that's slightly, uh, that's at any Indiana University folklore department have the recordings, but that's going to cost a lot of money to get mechanical copies of the field recordings. It's just, it's not for, I, I don't know enough about which songs I need to be able to say, get me a transcription of this one and this one. But it, 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 uh, similarly, there was one university uh, near Bohol, uh, slightly west of Bohol, uh, where it also has an archive copy, but they've not replied to my email inquiries. So this is where uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying I need to do that Visaya thing specifically, but I'm I'm look, trying to get some other language bases. And since my long term is eventually to come back to the Philippines, I will be a permanent resident in the coming years. Uh, I say let, let's let's start building some research connections. <laughs> uh, 
linked to what I just alluded, I, I, I just do want to have a standing offer for any faculty or graduate students if you were looking for some uh, uh, electronic database resources, journal articles, or things like that, I can secure through my university's library system. Uh, just let me know. Uh, this is what I did when I was teaching in Thailand while I still had access to my doctoral university's database. When I was doing my research literacy class, everyone had to do their annotated bibliographies. And so it's like, okay, <laughs> let's see what we can find on your topic. <laughs> So uh, that, I think that's a, a practical spin-off of this, is if, if anyone was having trouble accessing some full text articles through your library system uh, and you want to reach out to me, I could see what I can try to dig up to try to get that to you as a fair sharing of intellectual academic scholarship. <laughs> that's so wonderful news, Dr. Yeah, Fielding. Uh, perhaps I can link you with the... Our head librarian with okay. the College of Music, and I know she retired the the previous one, but <laughs> yeah, we have a new one now. So uh, we'll see how we can do um, yeah. uh, linkage you now in terms of the library access resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it'll be a manual thing for for me, but I'm glad to try to help that way. Thank you for the offer. Thank you. I, I think it's important. <laughs> when I was in Thailand. And I walked through their music library. And I looked at a couple sample theses, and I just saw there was a whole lot of Wikipedia citation. Just like, okay, that led to me then advocating for them to get some electronic databases. And I hope they're doing okay now. But <laughs> thank you for the um, kind offer, Doctor Fielding. Uh, Nico was raising his hand earlier. Nico, is there a yeah? Um, I, I wanted to ask. Uh, thank you, JJ. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Fielding. So, uh, I, because it seems like since you made a comment, uh, you made an offer, a very kind offer to to make certain resources available to to our scholars. Yeah. At the same time, um, you've also had some experiences in having challenges to find some resources. Um, ha has this? Um, uh, what are your other? Um, uh, insights or maybe you know plans in relation to archival research because it seems like uh, what you're doing is literally uh, gathering the archive um, and um, it's like uh, you're making notations out of them uh, will this lead to some more formal archiving uh, aside from the uh, aside from the the what the thing that you're already doing uh, creating linkages for people um, would it be possible to have a uh, uh, an archive, for example, of the songs that you you uh, made notes on. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, what I've been doing, because I know most people don't really know a lot of, or care <laughs> about post-tonal music theory labels, uh, what I've been doing is I've been creating some open educational resources that are inspired through the lens of Kodai music education. So like that pitch map that I showed, uh, so I, I've done some public publishing uh, through the International Kodai Society, Kodai Society of Canada, and my own some website posting of where I just list a whole lot of songs. I've got the pitch maps. I, I uh, show what uh, some basic material that's more reasonable for uh, K through 12 or, or undergraduate oral skills curriculum of how they may talk about it. And to align with Kodai, I'm using a law-based minor approach for, for describing modal materials. but. It, just to conform to the Canadian Kadai concept with that, but uh, uh, so I've I've tried to disseminate it uh, through music educational resources. Uh, I, I have seen other theses and dissertations where people are taking Southeast Asian language rep song repertoire and uh, doing their own transcriptions or doing their own encodings and then showing how this could align with certain grade level education systems. So uh, while I'm not doing the this is a grade four or this is a whatever the label is thing, I'm just, uh, I, I am working to get more stuff out there. Uh, what I, yeah, so I, some of it uh, never publishing enough. Uh, I'm just uh, I'm doing, doing the admin job right now for the last decade. So it's, <laughs> you don't get enough time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, and I guess what I meant to say with that, for like w with how I cast some of this survey into Kodai music education land, everyone needs to write for their perceived readership. Who's going to read and who's going to benefit from what you're doing? And how can you make it accessible to them? 
what I showed you, post-tonal, all this mapping stuff, a lot of people will not know what that is. And unless you've taken a specific music since 1950 type analysis course, you don't know. And, and so that alienates a, a whole lot of the world. And so you have to bring it back to how can you make this accessible? Like if I tried to publish that in an ethnomusicology journal, they, they'd just say, what? What are you doing? <laughs> so, so sometimes I just show them uh, the end result. Like at some of the conferences, like the International Council for Traditional Music, when I do some presentations there, I hint at the architecture of how I'm getting the info, but that I, I just focus on the music notation to say, here's the emergent trends, to try to make it accessible to a broader readership. Very insightful sharing, Dr. Fielding. It, it, of course, it's a... It's a big help for all of us who are also working on our own research to consider consider our readership, to consider how uh, we can bring our research to a more, um, I guess, human level of <laughs> where people can just enjoy the knowledge together and not really get lost in it or something. Well, I, I don't want anyone to do what I did. Is like I just kept digging into the data, digging into the numbers, and eventually my one of my advisors said, y you got to get rid of this. So I had to flush 100, delete 120 pages of stuff. <laughs> just simplify it. <laughs> so it's just, it all becomes stuff to try to do something with at a later date. But uh, uh, you, you can get lost in the data. You can get lost in what you love. And so you just try to remember, why are you doing this? Who are you trying to... Uh, share and educate with your perspective and, and how, how can you write your own success story because you're, you're all doing new stuff you're all forging new th pathways and, and we're just here to just help help support your growth <laughs> wow very inspiring words from dr fielding thank you so much for um gracing us today uh, are there further questions from the participants anyone else who would like to ask or can we have a comment from dr muiko yeah i'm i'm curious as to how do the numbers make sense in terms of uh for instance she mentioned about the hexatonic you know the preference for that uh, scale and how and why would that be more preferred or have you dug deeper into the historical context or the aesthetic context of, say, Nova Scotia culture and other stuff? I mean, I'm trying to link now the quantitative with the qualitative uh, inquiry, you know? Okay. Uh, making sense of the numbers, you know? Okay. Practice. Yeah, uh, so at, at one level, uh, at, at generalizing, a lot of the songs we, we for this, this is, again, this is tonal, modal song, folk song repertoire that I was looking at. Uh, so invariably, there's all these relations to the major minor scale or a mode. But not every song covers every scale degree. And so this is a way of uh, focusing in on what are the trends for some of these smaller collections. Like pentatonic is fairly distinct. The hexatonic, I'm not saying that, that it is the be all and end all, but there's a lot of melodies that don't span all seven pitches. And so for me, if you look at a lot of songs and you count up how frequent certain scale degrees occur, they can say, well, wh what are the normative patterns or what are the outlier? Where, are the, where is it less common? I, I suppose if I were trying to compose a Nova Scotian folk song, I would have some guidance from this about what the basic pitch repertoire is to choose from. Uh, but but uh, what I'll say is, uh, for me, it, it's not that it's now, this is the hexatonic vocabulary I need to know about. Uh, f for me, it's, it was the practice of a case study to take a look at some repertoire, and, and now let's go somewhere else where I don't know anything about the repertoire, and let, let's see what trends emerge from that. Uh, and so it's uh, uh, the, there's some overlap, and like a lot of these hexatonics directly reinforce uh, the, the s seven note scales above it. But it's just saying there's a, several hundred of these songs that don't use that one of these scale degrees. Why is that? And which one is that? And and, and that suggests the, the, the maybe uh, that 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 pitch is is not as significant. It's not as prevalent. <laughs> now everyone. 
a lot of people are still going to call a hexatonic scale a major scale. They're, they're, they're still going to call it. <laughs> it's like, well, it's, it's got a leading tone. It's got a median. Okay, it's a scale. <laughs> but I was just trying to do the bean counting to try to focus and look at the trends within a specific number. Like technically any pentatonic scale with one chromatic semitone is technically a hexatonic collection. Though a deeper read may say, you know, let's just look at the next level of saying what are, I'll say, the true pentatonic scales that then have chromatic nuances. That, that's something I haven't even started to look at. But that, that I'll say, would be an interesting thing to do. Okay, well, but also we also look forward, perhaps, so when you look into folk songs in the Philippines and uh, what would be the that sort of the take off from there, no, from the, the the patterns and the numbers and all these things and how it can make sense. Because um, I remember reading uh, Jose Maceda, our national artist for music. He uh, he wrote about the theory of four and theory of five in uh, in uh, not just Philippine music but in Asia, Southeast Asian music as a whole. No, how it makes sense even connect that with uh, the architecture of. Um, uh, temples uh, and uh, different um, uh, analysis of space, no use of space, no. So uh, it's it's very cultural, no. Um, uh, it's very cultural, like in the Gong traditions, for example, no. Uh, right. Certain scales make sense, uh, or in Koto, why do you have this, uh, you know, different modes of, uh, you know, using Japanese Koto, for instance. No? So certain. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about how these numbers make sense in culturally. No? And what you're now talking, as I am a music theorist, trombone playing singer, I know that there's a lot that's not in my scope of expertise. So this is which is what invites interdisciplinary uh, uh, scholarship or co-authorship of, of trying to work on stuff. Because I know that I don't have the cultural context to be able to speak to some of the things that you've alluded to, but I can help prepare some of the materials that can help inform the conversation. It's just someone that is far more nuanced and experienced in these other, in those specific cultural settings for the music making experience. You might be able to say, oh, this makes sense why that is. Yep, 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 you've correctly, you see all these things that are happening, and this pattern reinforces this activity or this action. And that, that's where I'll say also in the social sciences, humanities, there's not enough uh, co-authorship of research to make stronger opportunities. Uh, because m many an ethnomusicologist has to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> and so they wind up fixating on their, their pockets of expertise because there's so many facets, as you've just alluded to. I know that I, I can walk this far, I can, and, and there's a whole lot of other conversations out there. That's right. Uh, also, part of the, um, the, the concentration that we have now in the graduate program is also to actually strengthen our quantitative uh, approach <laughs> to music. No? Um, uh, perhaps this is one step, you know, listening to how you uh, analyze, you know, music, or songs in terms of the speeches and patterns yeah. and stuff like that. Can it make sense? Uh, it's a micro of the micro, you know, like looking at it, uh, not just, uh, I don't know, but it, 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 in terms of the, the, the small intervals, for example, between yeah. the scales and all that stuff, you know. And how we can, and all, but uh, yeah, of course, uh, how it how it can make sense in a, in a greater. You, you go from micro to macro in terms of that analysis. Yeah, and, and if we get rid of the uh, uh, ignore the pitches entirely, like for all vocal song material, looking at the rhythm, the meter, the durations of the sounds, of the poetry that's going on. Uh, there's a whole lot of literature uh, you, you could work on that side of the fence. Uh, and like quantitative analysis is merely applying a way of counting. <laughs> so whether you say long, soft, long, short for, for syllable lengths or things, you, you can use the other uh, existing ways of assessing and tabulating things to help inform your conversation. Okay, so uh, JJ uh, and uh, the rest are the, um, can we proceed with the certificate of appreciation now? Uh, it's already past five, I think there are classes after this. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. No, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Unless if there are more questions, we still like, we can still accommodate a little bit uh, of time. I think there are no more questions, ma'am. 
Okay. Uh, Ms. Shirley, can you share screen the Certificate of Appreciation? Nandiyan ba si Ms. Shirley? Oh, yun. Nandiyan siya. Cheryl, can you uh, sh uh, share screen? Okay. We, uh, we'd like to read out the Certificate of Appreciation for Dr. Fielding. Uh, the University of the Philippines College of Music Graduate Programs awards this Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Peter G. Fielding for sharing his knowledge on post-tonal analysis for ethnomusicological and music education inquiry during our master classes afternoon, November 23, 2022, signed by the Graduate Programs Coordinator, Dr. Maria Christine Moico, and the Dean of the College of Music, Laverne C. de la Peña, PhD. Thank you so much, Dr. Fielding, for gracing us with your research and presence this afternoon. Salama, thank you very much. I'm just thank you so much. We, we'd, we'd like to call for everyone to open their cameras so we can have a <laughs> picture taking. We can have a screenshot. And thank you so much, Dr. Fielding, for this time. Oh, thank thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. Stop share na lang po so we can <laughs> take a picture together. There we go. But we're going to open po ng cameras and smile to the camera everyone kunwari <laughs> fresh one two three hold the smile for five seconds one two three <laughs> smile okay we got that picture thank you so much thank you everyone and thank you to dr fielding for sharing his expertise and until the next uh master class see you guys see you, everyone and thank you. Having just, a great, have a great end of your semester. <laughs> thank you so much, Doctor Feely. Enjoy the Thanksgiving holidays. Oh, well, we're here to celebrate some American holidays. <laughs> Take care. I think we're still live.